Good evening. My name is Solana Chetman. I'm the Director of Creative Practice and Social Impact here at The Shed. And I am thrilled to welcome you to an outlook on particular matters. The first of our six conversations that will take place in conjunction with the exhibition Particular Matters by artist Tomas Saraceno on view at The Shed um, through April 17th. I want to start by sharing um, the points of access that are available on Zoom tonight. Live closed captioning is provided by Nicole Kochi. To turn it on, please click the CC button in the bottom right of your Zoom window. We also have American Sign Language available, um, interpretation available provided by Monique Sarpi and Justine Rivera, who will be pinned by our team and therefore should be visible at all times. And for the images in our presentation, visual description is provided by Michelle Mantion. Please click the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom window and select visual description. For any questions you'd like to ask to our speakers during the discussion, please use the Q&A button. That's also at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will have a dedicated section towards the end of the conversation to answer as many of them as we can. And if you have comments or requests throughout the conversation regarding your participation, please feel free to use the chat um, feature to connect with our team at any point. Tomas Araceno is an artist whose decades long practice has been dedicated to imagining sustainable futures in an era of climate emergency. His activated projects aim to rethinking the co-creation of the atmosphere, working with local communities, scientific researchers, and a broad range of institutions around the world to seek out a more equal balance of human, techno, and biodiversity with an understanding of situated and collectively developed knowledge. His work and, and this particular exhibition at the Shed, his largest in the US to date, delve into incredibly complex and layered concepts through beautifully simple and impactful artistic gestures. A window into a universe of inquiry, activism, and interspecies collaborations. In putting together this series, um, Matters for Conversation and Action, in close collaboration with Columbia Climate School and the Saraceno Studio, we intend to provide both different entry points and perspectives into Tomas's work, as well as expand on the connections between the work and some of the key contemporary discussions around environmental justice and the intersection of art and science. I want to thank very specially the Ford Foundation for supporting and making this series possible, as well as our partners and today's speakers. Joining Tomas in conversation tonight, we have um, Emma Enderby, curator of the exhibition and former chief curator here at The Shed and currently the head of programs and research and chief curator at Haus der Kunst in Munich, and Hans Ulrich Obrist, who is our, our senior artistic advisor at The Shed and also artistic director of the Serpentine Galleries in London. Before I leave you all to it, I want to encourage you to visit our website to see our full list of upcoming conversations running through the end of the exhibition, and of course, to get tickets to come see the show in person. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce my wonderful colleague, Alex Schroeder from Columbia's Climate School, um, while thanking her for her ongoing collaboration. And then I'll ask Alex that you pass the baton to Emma, Hans, and Tomas. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And I'm so excited about this conversation. Thank you so much, Solana. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alex Schroeder. I'm the Associate Director of Academic Initiatives at the Columbia Climate School, and I've had the great pleasure to work with Solana and the SHED team to help shape this public programming series, which, of course, connects to and builds on the incredible and thought-provoking art of Tomas Saraceno. Uh, thank you to both the SHED and Studio Saraceno for your inspiration and hard work on this exhibit and event series. So I'm really pleased to welcome everyone here on behalf of the Columbia Climate School, which serves as the Integrated Center of Climate Activity at Columbia University. Our school aims to provide the scholarship needed 
to tackle the climate crisis and related problems, as well as provide potential solutions through interdisciplinary research, partnerships, education, innovative technologies, and the sharing of ideas. This public program series is a great example of the power of interdisciplinary collaborations, which is one of the core tenets of the Climate School. These discussions will bring together scientists, artists, policymakers, philosophers, activists, community representatives, and more to explore a diverse range of topics connected to climate and environmental justice. Art and science share a common motivation and goal to understand and describe the world around us. Both worlds require a great deal of creativity, innovation, and dedication. Bringing these fields together through this series serves as a powerful way to inspire new ideas, build new bridges, and forge innovative pathways forward. So on that note, thank you everyone for joining us here tonight, and I will hand it off to tonight's panelists, Emma, Tomas, and Hans. I was muted. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here with Thomas Arasono, Hans Ulrich Obris. We're here to discuss the Sheds exhibition, Free the Air, which is a large exhibition of new and recent work spanning both our galleries and our McCourt space that really continues Thomas's themes that he's been exploring throughout his practice, how everything is radically interconnected, how we can envision a path for humanity in our era of climate emergency. The show imagines a world free from fossil fuels, discusses air pollution, air quality, environmental racism and environmental justice, and continues Tomas's collaboration with spiders and their webs. But to begin at the beginning, Hans Ulrich loves beginning, beginning stories. I ask you, Hans Ulrich, to take us through that story of Tomas's beginning. Thank you so much, uh, Emma. Thank you so much, Thomas. Actually, I thought it would be interesting to indeed begin with the beginning because we met in the early 2000s. It must have been probably 2003 in Venice when uh, actually Olafur Eliasson and I, together with Stefano Boeri, Molly Nesbitt and others, were teaching at the UAF in, uh, in Venezia. And you arrived actually uh, there um, uh, as a student. It was basically after the Städtelschule. And um, I will never forget that in this very, very first seminar, you suggested uh, that we should actually, for the next seminar, invite by telephone. So it was almost like, it wasn't a Zoom, but it was a telephone conference, Gyula Kosice. And of course, Gyula Kosice is a pioneering Argentinian artist whom you met early on mm. when you were very young in, in Argentina. He's the co-founder of an art movement, of the Madi Art Movement, but he also came up with extraordinary concepts of flying cities, uh, of hydrospatial uh, uh, cities. And I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about these early inspirations and how it all began. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Hans. It's a big pleasure to be here with all of you. And I'm so happy about the exhibition and all what is happening and all the things that are happening with the webs, the spiders, and and all the work. But um, yes, it's true. Uh, was uh, Yula Kosage was always a, is any still a big inspiration for me and for the work. And I remember I was a student of architecture at that time in Buenos Aires. And I remember somebody said, well, you have to meet Yula Kosage, urge and urgent. It was almost king. And then I went to the studio and, and it was amazing. It was so much interest in architecture and, and, and far beyond. And uh, was somebody who all the time, I remember um, this first book, 500 Lugares para Vivir, and there are 500 places to live. Uh, and I remember it's, it's all these spaces that he described, his hydrospatial cities, um, which um, instead of describing like kind of a normal tone of architecture, this is a living room, this is a, a place, a bathroom, and so on and so forth, we're kind of uh, embedded in poetic, a place for forget who, uh, where you come from, or a space to connect with the interplanetary source of uh, energy, um, was, you know, maybe like Pessoa, you know, we, um, a place for to forget, you know, the place for forget how, the way how we have learned, how things like that, you know, completely, but lit with a way of our architecture also somehow work. Um, 
and then you know you, you you go through to his research and then you you see that uh, he was also meeting engineers at nasa and uh, not only with with poets uh, at that time but uh, but really trying to push forward the idea to try to make it happen and i think so that uh, was something which uh, we you know we brought the idea that um you know there, there, there was something another possibility of rethinking architecture uh, in relationship with a uh, with the space and i think space in in not only on terrestrial but also on a, on a cosmic scale and yeah, at the time also i was watching carl sagan and uh, cosmos and, and many other inspiration which i think so was a the right link also on uh, on also the politics of also how um you know the gentrification and all the, the the land properties and was also very rooted in politics also his discord i think so no, it's interesting also because that very first time when we met you already had uh, a movement formed it was basically uh, a movement you had invented the year before called cloud cities um you asked us to introduce you to the mayor of venice you wanted immediately to kind of become to make venice into a cloud city and of course that idea of the cloud city was also inspired by buckminster fuller can you tell us about this this idea of of cloud city and how so early as a student you came up also with the idea of a movement because i think it's interesting in relation to the show here to think about this cloud city idea no, first is a little bit to let's say ground the idea. You know, as it seems that there is no a city floating in the sky today, right? Actually, there is a city, and there is a billions of people who fly every day on an airplane on a, on an addiction of a fossil fuel, who live very extreme consequence for many human beings on planet Earth. He's calculated today that every time that we cross the Atlantic, somewhere in the planet. Uh, will uh, diminish his lifespan for two years every time that one of us will travel. This is a, a, a direct consequence on, on, on today how mobility is spread through the air and how much this mobility also is uh, is affecting uh, human civilization and, and 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 it's a city it's a huge infrastructure you know planes are all the time now with the pandemic the numbers have been a little bit low but it's kind of going back again it's been this kind of a little bit rethink about how these these existing cities have maybe can learn something clouds and instead of uh, of flying we can float and there is a discussion of uh, are we flying or floating on the planet earth and then we bring back back mr fuller which always was thinking about uh, the idea of the spaceship earth now in relation with the spaceship earth now working with a community in, who in argentina I, i'd like to bring back the concept of pacha or pachamama which is mothership earth and try to maybe leave the idea of the mac idea and try to go to something which is more about floating more about thinking about a thermodynamic imagination of how we can kind of maybe learn to really float in the atmosphere and it's not so much aerodynamic but more aerostatic it's more about santos dumont when he think about uh, um, stillness in motion no when you when you become with the way you know when let's say when when you reach this thermodynamic equilibrium is these sculptures that we built is not something that I invented but have been very little investigated you you have an envelope and depending of the color of this envelope is heated up by the sun and then it became buoyant it kind of defy gravity uh, now by but this very simple very sim, uh, simple principle Archimedes, which have invented the principle of flotability now we were in syracuse flow the same principle in the air has been we can rethink about uh, the sentence of torricelli the student of Galileo. we live at the bottom of ocean of air and this means we have to learn also how we can float in this ocean of air and it seems you know there is a very very simple we, we, we can make it and we are doing it i mean and part of this is uh, is upstairs now building a community that <clears throat> somehow is not only about having kind of a technological maybe advancement but really think about maybe in the book of Felix, you know how we can think about ecologies of practice in relationship with uh, he have a book which is called the three ecologies no and uh, and it's like a environmental ecology the social ecology and the mental ecology and how these ecologies somehow you need to weave a new type of response ability and the ability to respond and how much we are responsible for uh, engage with today and maybe we talk about climate emergency but i think so we have to talk about climate injustice he was i think so is is urgent to really understand that and that brings us to the show and uh, i wanted to ask you both uh, to talk about the exhibition a bit um which um connects actually beginnings and which your, your inspirations molly wants to know what would jonah friedman say we have here 
question from Molly Nesbitt. So this is a question from Molly for you. Thank you. Um, exactly what Jonah Friedman will say. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think so he could be happy, uh, and I hope so. Uh, we could pay money also to him, like with Yula Kosic, and uh, he was a fantastic person, I think, so was so visionary and rethinking all about, uh, you know, mobility and nomadic ways of, of living. And, and I think so. There's a book of James C. Scott, uh, which is called Against the Grain, and I think it's very beautiful about rethinking about how the states organize in relationship of, of, um, of agriculture and um, just remember uh, Manfredo Furi on that extent of, of how cities were invented and maybe we can think about uh, the cloud cities, no? that the origin of the cities is not so much um, a technological invention, but it seems that, you know, the, the hunter and gathering tribes around the planet Earth, and this is something uh, that Tafuri will come up, um, was with the idea that, um, you know, many will think that, uh, you know, was the invention of agriculture which allow uh, these tribes which will um, you know, um, um, follow the seasons, right? Uh, follow the climate instead to kind of cultivate or fix the climate in a region. And agriculture, it seems, is, is a place that, you know, it allows us to establish and, and to lose these uh, nomadic uh, habits. Um, while uh, Lewis Manfred think uh, the, the origin of the city is the and it's not so much about this uh, technological, it's more about, uh, you know, they were hunting and gathering when somebody will die, and they will bury it under the ground, they will build a pile of, of stones on top. And then in, in these, uh, in these uh, journeys, they will always want to come back to be close to their loved ones, to the people who were dead. And, and that love to be close to that people is what then agriculture was invented, was developed. But it was always like more a love affair, something that you have an affection to a place that it makes you then develop something and i think it's very beautiful and maybe we can dedicate it to Jon Friedman. thank you so much and Jona of we have to him to Jona so and of course Jona I also talked about concrete, uh, your concrete utopia actually with your new piece at the show. But I wanted to actually not begin with that, but maybe in terms of the exhibition, actually not start with the beginning of the show, but the spine of the show. A work actually, uh, you and, Ma and Thomas all breathe uh, the same air. Could you tell us about this work? I think so. This was a, it's also a collaboration, I think. So. It was very, very beautiful, and I think so. This, I think, is so. also a. a what is maybe Emma? You could uh, you could tell us a little bit. Yeah. Well, it really it began with you. Um, the conversations, the research uh, with Harriet Washington, uh, the scientist who wrote the brilliant book on environmental racism, um, that really charts through data how air quality, access to air quality, good air to soil to water in this country is really divided across racial lines. And from that, um, and from some of the work you'd already been doing in documenting air quality um, with work such as Printed Matter and, and the piece that you did in, in Paris, it was like, how do we start thinking about that and gathering that information for, for the US? Um, so this it was before the pandemic started. It was before, I mean, this yeah. show had been thought since. <laughs> yeah. what? Four or five years. Four or five years. Which started. <laughs> this is a long way. Exactly. I mean, this came much, much yeah. before the, the presence of the pandemic that year now is much more. But I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, it's, yeah, it's true. And there's this, this machine and, uh, called the EBAM, and it's used by environmental agencies all over the country that collects um, air quality. And what it does, I mean, you explain this so well, but essentially it kind of sucks the air every hour and filters out PM 2.5 which is um, a very carcinogenic particle um, that causes um, great impact on human and on human life and print and sucks it out. And then that's what you see as a dot that appears every hour. And uh, with a, our dear colleague, our curatorial colleague, uh, Alessandra Gomez, we reached out to all 52 states, um, all environmental agencies within those states asking for them to send us their roles from the EBAM and then through that 
developed this really expansive work that you'll see in the exhibition, which um, through states charts the various different uh, air qualities of that particular state. And it's incredible. We have kind of written what, which each state is, and it's very f surprising for some. Some moments are less surprising. Hawaii, not much uh, air pollution, but Alaska is the darkest state that you'll see in that mix, which, you know, when you think about that state in terms of not only its extraction, um, its burning of fuels in the house, in big industry, it's also the nature of the climate there, the snow, it traps that carbon, but also various deregulations that have been happening in that state, which stop any kind of control, environmental control with air, water and, and, and such. And, and let's not forget again, because uh, when we when we think about uh, you know there are these uh, kind of very simple statistic but uh, you can help me with the numbers but the first year of the pandemic i think so approximately 1.6 yeah, 1 yeah. 1 1.8 million people have died uh, caused uh, through the uh, you know coronavirus pandemic and in the same year caused to the bad quality of the air up to Seven, no, no, five times more. Oh, five times you remember, more, yeah. five times more people have died. This means is a, the bad quality of the air is a huge uh, mm -hmm. cause of. I think it's the second highest cause of mortality today on planet Earth, and and people already which are you know have respiratory problem then get affected even worse with with the bad quality of the air. You know, asthma and and premature child. And this means is um is something which is um. Yeah, it's quite striking, no? Rebecca Solins also pointed out on, on, on the idea of, of saying, hey, and we know exactly what is the cause of these particles floating in the air today, right? And these clouds of, of pollution, which are so much present. But the addiction of this fossil fuel is so strong that it seems, and we have the cure, you know, stop burning so much. Mm -hmm. And and somehow uh, this inability, you know, from from certain parts of the population, no? Let's put it, we are not living on the Anthropocene, but in the capital scene. Right, I think so. This huge distinction between about the access to all these inequalities and that the, the climate is, is pushing us uh, as are part of the exhibition. I think so. there is we also a quote, oh. um, here where you said, which connects in a way, and I wanted to ask you both to to comment on that in a way, uh, Thomas. You said because the movements for climate justice have been saying for a long time that the objective is to change the system, not the climate. Mm. Well, I don't say this, you know, as the phrase from many activists <laughs> around the world, but I think so is. Uh, yeah, how are uh, usos y costumbres, no, you are our habits, really, if we, we manage to, to a lift, be shift uh, that, that possibility. I'm always thinking, you know, when, when we, you know, work with the community, with Aerosene, and, which is really kind of a, a community-based practice that, have been inspired by the do it yourself, but we think about do it together mm -hmm. and how we kind of rethink about that and that and that that, that way of 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 of, of changing, no, changing the habit or how the work also change yourself. And then, for example, we, you know, sometimes people think, okay, with this new flying sculpture, you will be able to travel. And and the people who are very much techno driven, they think, well, this is a new invention. This will change. And actually, what what it changed more is about is it, you know, it's very difficult to to mm -hmm. to give the time to accept that that possibility will produce a change. It's mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, the social component, I think, so is very, very, um, you know, present. Because, for example, with MIT, we developed something which is called a floating predictor with, with aerosin. Has been, let's say, if I go back to Berlin, uh, it calculates 700 weather stations all around the world, and, and it tells you when is the best day within 15 days, that more or less we can predict the weather, uh, the wind will take you to the place where you want to go. I mean, if I decide to go to Berlin, he will tell me, well, maybe the best condition where the wind will take you there is in four days. Mm -hmm. Now, are we accepting? And we will burn zero fossil fuel, zero carbon, just moved by the wind. Uh, and, and you know this time that we need to give and today you know it's pretty much based when you do a search in google you always search about when, when is the cheapest ticket mm -hmm. right and but at which cost for who right has been sometimes you know technology is there right uh, and, and we know it's, it's our reach but are we willing to accept it are we giving that time needed for for yeah. processing yeah i mean that's what i love about i did i tracked that once from new york to my hometown in bristol in the uk and I think it was going to be a six day journey and sent me round uh, the globe once or twice. But then that's the maybe the shift that you have to make around your relationship to time 
as you say, um, maybe that is what you need to do. Yeah. Inverted said always, it's not the, the destination, but the journey that you have yeah. to enjoy. And Hans, you are taking a lot of trains now. I heard about it. Yeah, actually, I think the uh, movement of night trains is really important that we bring night trains back. And in Europe, there was this amazing network of night trains where we all started. I mean, in a way, in the 90s, early 2000s, it was still around, and many of these night trains have disappeared. Cedric but, Price, but the they're now brought back. The train when he made exactly, and Cedric had this idea he wanted to make an art school and a museum on uh, on night trains. But of course, it leads to uh, also slow travel, and. That leads me to a question, a more general question I wanted to ask you, Thomas, which is really um, when Roman Kaczanik talks about the idea that we need to liberate society from this idea of short termism, no, and think about more longer durational projects, um, or what I call it la longue durée, uh, I wanted to ask you about that and see if you have projects. Um, which are more long durational, which are not related to exhibitions. Uh, I mean, at the moment we can see, for example, Precious Okoyoman decided in Aspen to do a garden instead of an exhibition. A garden is of course slow, no? Ottobong Nakanga and Inka Shonibare, independent of each other, decided to start farms, no? In Nigeria, as artistic projects, but also as real farms, these are slower projects. Do, do you have such projects which are evolving more over, you know, years or decades or, or centuries? Well, I, I think so. Part of the exhibition in the last floor is um, is the community of Arosin, basically, and that it started with uh, something which is called Museo de Solar, which is a collection of plastic bags. It's kind of the graveyard of the capital city, you know, hyper consumption of the single use plastic bag, which is so present still today on the planet Earth, which is producing so much damage to the fishes, to the planet, to ourselves. And we see how at the end we and the fish eat the plastic bag and when we eat the fish and then so on and so forth. This means a continuation is still New York today. I know that would charge you a couple of cents for every bag, but it's amazing the amount of bags that you find everywhere. This means it's a little bit like a comment about, uh, it's, it became kind of a movement, you know, we based kind of this instruction of how you could kind of float in the atmosphere free from fossil fuel just by maybe giving a second chance to uh, um, a material which have a kind of embedded value that somehow we trash it too soon, too fast, and we are not responsible or we are not able to respond maybe of the value of this plastic. And then, you know, from that, that we, I think so, um, it starts from something we post on the internet uh, very early on, I think so. 2002, 2003 have started. And from there, you know, has spread a kind of worldwide, you know, people kind of download the instruction and start to build this kind of a, a flying canvases also, because in this, uh, many people leave messages. And and I think so that was, um, you know, a beginning of, of kind of a, somehow a movement, no? Now we, there are many, um, I have seen friends all around the world, we, we think about, you know, maybe, uh, what is an era, no? Because uh, in relation with the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, we are thinking about the era of the air, the Aerocene, and, and what it might um, look like if we kind of think in advance. So we name something before that it had happened, right? And how much our action might kind of start to change when we have kind of an idea of an era that we would like to live with, no? This going back to the concrete utopia, no? But this, but this gesture. And the other one, you know, I'm seeing now in the image, uh, an image of, um, of Aerosin working together with the 33 communities in the Salt Lake in Cujuy, Argentina, where you could see also a message from the community who lives over there. Uh, el agua y la vida vale más que el litio. The water and, um, and life are worth much more than lithium. And these communities are suffering uh, a lot from uh, this energy transition that uh, Western society are, are doing, thinking that moving from fossil fuel to green energy and electric energy will have, have cost. Now, every ton of lithium will require two million liters of water. And all the communities who are living at the edge of this lake are suffering a lot from this way of extracting. I mean, this colonial approach to till digging on these mineral seems have not happened. Uh, is, uh, not, nothing has changed. Besides um, that our mobile phone, uh, are keep extracting data and information and privacy mercilessly. This I mean, to a certain extent, you know, are these project, uh, and in this case was Leticia Marquez, a, a, a female pilot uh, in Argentina, that for the first time was able to lift up herself in the air without any rope. And then we, we managed to break uh, 33 world record for the most sustainable flight in human history, uh, uh, certified five, 
FI, Federation Aeronautic International. This means it's the first time that somehow, uh, not men, but in this case, a woman, uh, with the message, with the community living on the ground, we are thinking that if we relate differently, a uh, different scale uh, with the planet, with the sun, and try to find this equilibrium, we might be able to, to float again on, on Pacha or Pachamama. There's one more ongoing project that's still ongoing here at the shed where we installed one of these EBAM machines that monitors the air quality on the roof of the shed. And we installed that in 2019 and it's been running since that moment. And I'm very interested to see once we put all those roles together, that shift when we all sheltered in place and what it looks like in that in that period. And I think that it, it's interesting, we were planning this before the pandemic we postponed it due to the pandemic, but then so many of the themes resonate throughout, not only what we've been talking about with air quality, PM 2.5, et cetera, which you know, became so relevant to all of us, but also actually something you've talked about with me is the, uh, the, our relationship to the earth and the sound of the earth and how suddenly scientists could actually hear the earth in a way that hadn't been possible before, right? Well, every planet shakes and vibrates different rhythms right and many you know astrophysicists uh, can kind of perceive uh, the aliveness of the planet in, in relationship of of how each planet kind of uh, um, um, move and, and and the planet earth uh, when when it started the, at the beginning of the pandemic it have shift the, the the rhythms of how it vibrate due to the change of habits that uh, the minority of people living on the earth have changed their habits Right, is the minority, 1%, maybe something, think about the 30%, which I'm included. And this means that change of habit have really shift the ability, the, the, you know, how the earth vibrate. And this means the first uh, somehow movement that we think uh, was uh, was kind of an entry point for, for, for the concert that we are trying to think is, you know, how much the change of certain people on the planet Earth and their habits have really kind of even at planetary scales, have changed uh, the vibration of the Earth. And then due to this change of vibration of the Earth, uh, at pre-industrial level, does it mean the, the vibration, it moved back to, to that time. Um, now, because the, the, the Earth moved much, then we were able to hear things that we were not able to hear before. It mean, uh, uh, you know, a very, very tiny earthquakes happen in some part of the world we will be able to hear. And we know that spiders communicate through vibration. It mean, noise pollution in the city for spiders, for their ability to communicate one to each other um, is, is, is a disaster, right? And does it mean it's kind of slowing down and being able to, to vibrate different, I think, so was the entry point also of the project. There is also something which is often, I think, recurrent in your shows, which is, the sort of micro macro dimension that uh, in a way uh, there is changing scale and we go from micro architectures of spiders to you know very large structures in the exhibition i wanted to ask you about that recurrent theme of changing scale um, because you once told me uh, that actually that is also about decentering the human perspective and about triggering the realization that our view of reality is not the only one and uh, <clears throat> i think it's really fascinating because whether it be opening our world to that of the spiders or in the case of the aerosene project thinking on a planetary scale or maybe even on a scale beyond the planet no on a sort of how would one say that in english extra planetary mm. kind of scale so in fact um i found this quote actually from our previous conversations where you said that relating to the interplanetary scale could help us reach a broader perspective on this planet. So could, could you expand some more on the ecological and also ethical potential you find in actually thinking and experiencing different scales, mobilities, maybe also infrastructures? Mm. Well, it seems a complicated question, but uh, but no, maybe I try to answer very simple. Um, um, you know, and, and what it still triggered me, uh, I think so, Mancuso have said this to me, um, uh, an Italian biologist, that spiders, and, and, and is, is known also, no, that spiders live on the planet Earth since 280 million years, while human sapiens, uh, late stage of, of humans, only 210,000 years. Right? It's 280 million years versus 210,000 years. Now, 
also biology said like more or less to be able to survive uh, in a place or learn to know how to live in a place minimum you have to learn, have to live for five million years has been humanity have still a long way to go in relationship with with spider living on this planet now and that's why I want to make a distinction. It seems that uh, there are some humans still on planet Earth, which I think so could make it, right, to, to the ability to reach the threshold of the five million years and go on as the love of the spider. And are the people who maybe do not have the phobias, or the arachnophobias, this fear of spider. Has been this bring me very simple about, you know, the spider diviners in Cameroon, in Somier, which is a very, very small population, up to 5,000, that uh, the way that the village uh, and the social and the political system is organized is also with the wisdom of the non-human, going back to the idea of the centralizing, you know, how we make decisions. And in this case, and it's present in the exhibition also, they have uh, ground-dwelling spiders who live in, in, in a hole, and then every time that the village needs some, some wisdom, some knowledge, some decision to make, they go and consult the spider. It might take one day, two days, a week. Sometimes the spider decides not to answer, you have to wait, and it takes quite a long process of this uh, spider divination process. Um, this means when we think again about, uh, uh, you know, when we put humans all in the kind of in one big bag, and then we try to separate again about, about the situated knowledge that each has. I think so, you know, when we think uh, today how much uh, this type of knowledge is start to move out, no? When we think about that only 5% of the population of the world, First Nation people, indigenous population are the world, they are the one responsible to maintain and preserve 80% of the biodiversity in the planet Earth. 5% of the population, preserving 80% of the biodiversity, and we know what is happening with this population, with that knowledge. Beside extractivism, uh, ideas of, of acquiring that knowledge with biopiracy, also is, is, is quite, um, you know, they're being decimated, you know, we see in Brazil, we need in many places around the world. I mean, what for me was crucial in the exhibition, and when I went to Somia also, is how we approach with that knowledge, how we can come with the terms on and other relationships. I mean, what was very, very important is when I went there is to hear Bulu. Pierre Bolo. And then he said, the first thing, Thomas, can you build a web page for me? I want that you build a web and I want to offer my service of spider diviner to the rest of the world. I mean, the, the approach came completely different. I mean, I, I was kind of making a service providing to his willing to share his knowledge to the world at their terms and their condition, their IP, the intellectual profit, the web page is belong to them. And when they offer the service, all the resources and all the economical resources goes to benefit of the village. This means when we exhibited the shed, you know, and I, we call him and said, do you want to show the piece? I said, yes. But you know, it's very different if I show a work that I document something which is not my knowledge without being able to invent an economical system or or in the way that they want to be presented themselves. And in this case, also have an economical retribution. This was uh, made me happy. This means whoever is interested, I've talked in the name of Bulu, go to nangdu.org, and then hopefully you place the question, and the village of Somia will, uh, will be very happy. What's the question you ask? <laughs> um, <laughs> and all of you have posed the question. Uh, I did not make any question. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, should we answer some of the questions that you have made? I remember Emma, uh, and it had been quite precise, right? The current president of the United States, uh, uh, 2019, was at the time where asked if he will continue his mandate, and the Spider answered that no, and this was quite right. More interesting than that. It was three. The Spider answered three times. No, but also said it would be it wouldn't be without a struggle. And at the time, I was like, oh, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, and of course, the spider, the spider was right. No, and going back to the, to the work, right? I mean, have happened so many things, right? When when we we work with Harriet Washington, we entered in those conversation, and then it came out the work. We do not breathe all the same air, and then was this, and it happened. What it happened with George Floyd? that he was very clear, say, I cannot breathe, right? Which is, I mean, it's not only like, a, there is a kind of a very racial division about which air is breathed in different parts of the country, but also it seems that some people are not even able to breathe, right? Has been, it, it kind of got, uh, I think, some more 
complicated as the spider might have also advised us. And let's put it that way, the spider also have a, a really a, a power of attorney somehow. If the spider answer for seven times consecutive that somebody is guilty of something, this person will go to jail. It's been the agency that, that also is given to, to somebody how we should organize, I think this is quite remarkable and interesting. And you mentioned Harry Washington and the importance of this book. Uh, you have a dialogue with Harriet Washington, and I think it led also to a text. Can you talk about that? Um, yes, yeah, so she contributed to, I mean, you've had multiple conversations. One that actually is, is you can find through our Up Close program on the SHED's website, but also she contributed to the, to the catalog as well in thinking about the relationship between Thomas's work, but also her research. Yeah. But we've gone from the Anthropocene to the Aerocene, but it's also from arachnophobia to arachnophilia, which Bolo is part of. It's also an open source community. A lot of it operate it operates internationally, but also outside of your studio. And one thing um, that is so like intrinsic to your thinking in the relationship with spiders, and you know, at the beginning, like the editorial team, you always write spider slash webs, and they'd always want to separate it. Spider, spider, and the web, spider and webs. And you were like, no, it's it's slash, it's spider slash webs which we've all come to embrace and understand, but I think it's important for you to talk through the arachnophilia and also this kind of concept. Yeah, um, um, I don't know, maybe a kind of an easy way to think is like when, when a spider, uh, you know, is in a place, is not able to, not all spiders weave webs. That's, I have to clarify. So spiders are, 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 are not, uh, or the web sometimes are not really spectacular. But the one who weave webs uh, is, is kind of, um, for example, if it is a very small place and it's not able to weave, very well, even if you place a mosquito or a cricket quite close to them, they will not many times be able to sense. It's been in the way when, when the spider weave the web, is kind of weaving the mouse or weaving the senses for herself to be able to perceive who is around it he's kind of um you know sometimes people now have a, a much more fresh relationship with the octopus right that the brain is not localized only here but also every tentacle is part of the way of thinking you can think that also the spider when it weaves the web offload part of the cognitive capacity to the web in itself you know to the extent that when it's not so hungry the spider it kind of release the tension of the web and then a very small fly when it touched the web she will not go and eat it. As I mean, this fly can grow bigger. Like when we go fishing, a small fish, we always give it back. And when it's a big fish enough, and the spider is made like this, this means you can think that the web is kind of, it goes the neural system out in the world. And when it's getting really hungry, she starts to tension this, and these strings. And this mean, a very small mosquito also, then she will be able to sense it. In that extent, you know, it's really kind of this, this um, and you know, the, the Incas and the Maya, they will count through the threads of the knots in, in I'm wearing now a Mayan t-shirt. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he's, he's really thinking that, uh, that, you know, the taxonomy, the way how science is organized somehow have made so much focus on the individual species in itself and not so much the connection across species and, and also kind of the, you know, sometimes we still, some people have the arrogance. We think we can live off this planet, right? Certain attitudes like, we can go to Mars and Moon, and, and still some space agencies have that, that approach. Well, well, I think it's crucial that we understand that uh, humans, at the this, at this stage we are, uh, we need this web of relationship. Maybe like Humboldt has said, this web of life that somehow weave and connect us, and, and we are so interdependent. And with that web, we will not be able to live. This means spiders who are deprived for the ability to weave that web, they cannot eat, they cannot sense the world. How many of the things you've just described and actually you've been talking about throughout the conversation come together in uh, the McCord space, in the biggest piece in the show, <clears throat> Free the Air, How to Hear the Universe in a Spider Web. It's a, it's a major commission um, and it brings together uh, spider webs, of course, spider divination, the arrow scene <clears throat> is in it. Um, it's a culmination of the show. Can you talk maybe a little bit about the experience uh, the visitor has entering this work. Yeah, um, yeah this was a huge challenge. I, I should really say thank you to all of you and thank you to the shed, to the team too. Really was an, 
it's, I think it's the largest work ever, which, uh, which uh, in, in this very particular place uh, we were able to realize. And, and, and it's, again, it's trying to, you know, for, for many years we have been recording and inventing somehow very sensitive devices to um, and record um, the way the house pilot communicate to each other. Uh, it's been a very sensitive microphone who are able to perceive even very, very tiny vibration. And, and, you know, with that, then we collaborate with the Max Planck Institute, with MIT, and we, with many, you know, institutions around the world with the biotremology department and, and so forth and so on. It's mean, uh, what it's happened, and then we thought like, how we will be able to sense that vibration. And I say sense because it's not about listening, right? Um, you have to think that, um, you know, like Jakob Vuxel might said, each somehow animal is embedded in the ability to sense the world through their own senses. And spiders many times uh, have a very poor vision. They, they don't see this amazing web that we admire so much. They don't see it because they just distinguish between the day and the night. Most of spiders who weave webs are almost blind, let's put it away. And they don't have ears, they cannot hear. Uh, and they are able to produce and sense vibration which go much below the human capacity. I mean, we hear up to 20 hertz, but spiders sometimes produce very low frequency. And this means how we can transmit that vibration. And this means this came this idea of the commission of the shed, which is kind of an anechoic chamber. Let's say when John Cage entered there and they hear his own brain making synapses, what we are thinking is like what it means today or the urgency of entering into another world, right? Not the, the world of the human brain itself, hearing your own thought, but I think so in this case is entering the world of the spider web and the spider web intelligence and try to not to hear, but to sense because there are all these shakers who vibrate at a frequency that we are not able to hear, up to five hertz. Has been in, in, in the commission what happened, you enter, the light go pitch black, you are not able to see anymore, you don't know where you are suspended. Every time somebody moves, you move. There's it a lot of a tremble. You have a you know, there is a whole another fear of of, of, of hives. Somehow you have to confront not only about the spiders and all these invented phobia, some culture have, some not. Hey, and then you know the concert is, is mostly there is a moment that yes, it's a bit sonic, then you go to the infrasound. And then you start to feel, hopefully, what uh, other worlds might be up there, and, and maybe we start to respect them differently, part of some cultures. It's an incredibly beautiful uh, experience, and I hope everyone can come um, to the shed and uh, go on the free the air. Um, I would love to allow a couple of moments for any questions that have come in over the over the chat. Um, I can't read it from there. Can you? Maybe you, you read it, Solana. <laughs> Solani. Will you? I pass you the microphone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Sorry, my eyes. We have a few questions, um, and I'll start by, where does the structure for the spider language come from? Um, yeah, well, we, we record a lot, no, but uh, uh, I'm thinking about uh, language, you know, and the structure of the language. And, and in that case, I'm thinking because the kind of the, the concert, which I don't know if it's a concert, I don't know if spiders want to talk with us. We have to respect their silent also. But well, we believe that if, if we start to engage differently, and they might want to talk to us, right? And, and in this case, I think so. What I can answer directly in language, because also they might not think that is a language what they use, right? Biology now they talk, uh, you know, animals who talk. Uh, it's, it's called biotremology, right? All, all language which uh, which is maybe it's not a language, but in that case, Mira, I'm thinking about Pierre Bolo when, which is the spider diviner in, in Somia, Cameroon, how he talk with the spider, and the way how he he translate the question that you have posed to him is through a stone and he vibrates the stone through this pen which is a metallic pen which is connected to the earth and somehow he whisper all these uh, question in mambila and then translate them in vibration language to the spider and and i think so that that the way that uh, um at least pierre Bolo is talking with the spider which i think so is a is a beautiful way uh, and and it seems uh, Quite successful because the answers were amazing. The answers were. 
Thank you so now, much. There are other ways that, <laughs> that we also record and communicate and, and how biology, let's say the more mainstream uh, type of science somehow, which is, uh, yeah, there are a little of courtships and, and, and way of signaling uh, different, uh, um, you know, there is a drumming spider. There is a moment of a testing of the web. When the spider is on the web, sometimes make plucking. This means it's, it's when, you, when you play a chord of a guitar, make ping, ping, ping. There is another way which is rubbing. You, you, you take the chord and move it like this to see if there is some imperfection, some holes on the web. This means there are spiders who have learned, there are cheating spiders who have learned the vibration of the end but actually the spider produced some vibration the other spider don't see but sense the vibration it, it comes and then eat each other this means that you know through the whole piece uh, there is a kind of a whole series of uh, vibration intertwined between the different spiders end up with a lot of vibration from the street because when we were recording on the on on, on this vibration uh, many tracks pass by the studio and these are the rumblings that you hear really kind of annoying that he disrupt all type of communication among the spiders and also among us wonderful thank you Tomas that is um, brilliant and so interesting I'll share one more um, someone is asking you mentioned that indigenous people um, or they're mentioning that indigenous people make up about five percent of the world population and that you suggested during the conversation that they are responsible for what percentage of natural resources uh, and they were saying that um, they think that these are our communities who have a lot of problems around ownership of property um, and uh, that maybe they misunderstood and I thought it was really interesting also in relationship to our last conversation. So I don't know if you want to share a little bit around that. I think so. First, they don't talk about natural resources, right? They don't have this relation with nature as we think, at least the, the community that have been in contact, right? They don't think nature as a resource, right? It's more like a stewardship. It's more like a, a mother relationship, you know? It's a something relation. But yes, what I have said is like, they are responsible for preserve a relationship with the environment, which is very different than the homo capitalosinus, I don't know if it exists even, uh, is, uh, is living today, right? But I don't know if I answered the question, right? 5% of the population are able to maintain, uh, um, you know, Natasha Mayer talked some things about a plant scene, right? How much the human with the plants are inventing new scene in relationship are about this relationship that is never detached nature from human has some culture are thinking today. So I think that is the end of our conversation this evening, this afternoon. Thank you so much, Thomas Hanzorek. Um, and thank you, audience, for, for listening in. Please join us for more talks to come uh, surrounding Thomas's exhibition, Particular Matters. And, and the audience might be the spiders also, right? I mean, how we invite the spiders, we might. And there are many spiders at the shed. If you look carefully, you and, and each, all around you, you. Each time you find one, you you mark it. Can you talk about this? Because we saw some. We are running. <laughs> yes. No, but but uh, but is uh, yeah. I mean, it was beautiful. Also, we invite uh, people from the Natural History Museum. They came down the road uh, up to Central Park, and uh, and then we asked them, uh, can we do a spider guided tour for all the visitors also to see that um, you know nature is not happening somewhere in. Uh, in a, in nature is, is here, right? And, and, and we found many spider web living at the shed. They're not paying the ticket. They are just sneaking through the cracks of the doors and they're hopefully enjoying now their respect. And this I mean, was very beautiful also. You know, sometimes we have these pest management controls, not only the phobias, and somehow during the time of the exhibition, our spider became friends. And this means everybody who look uh, at the web is able to somehow to contribute. And then you can run an oracle and you can start to ask questions and you can uh, engage in the world of the spider web, uh, hopefully. And we discussed with the spiders their unrealized projects. And I'm, I know we are out of time, <laughs> but I have to ask you uh, the only recurring question in all the conversation. I've asked you many times before, but I, uh, in mind, I thought it would be really interesting to, uh, to ask you now that the project here is realized, um, what are your so far still unrealized projects? And of course, we know a lot about architects' unrealized projects, and you started as an architect, but we know very little about artists' unrealized projects. And the reasons 
for projects to be unrealized are manifold. They can be too big to be realized. Sometimes they're too expensive to be realized. Um, sometimes it's too time intense. That can be a reason, but just hasn't had the time to realize them yet. There's also censorship. Some projects are unrealized because they're censored. And as Doris Lessing always said, there's also the project one hasn't dared to do, which is what she called self-censorship. So within this sort of wide field, can you tell us about one of your unrealized project which is particularly dear to you i mean uh, i have to be honest about uh, the commission we have built up here if you enter inside this is more rope hanging and i'm all the time say thomas what is that rope hanging there <laughs> and then i say oh i might watch something else you know what i mean and then keep asking keep up. and if you go to the commission you will see there is a rope hanging now these sculptures have been built, you know, we always think about Second Life, you know, we are thinking about a plastic bag, what we do after, what will happen with this big uh, uh, concert hall where we, for, for, for hearing that vibration of the spider, but you know, the Second Life that we are thinking that it will be wonderful then to kind of merge the community of Edison and being able to take that work and make a floating auditorium that uh, we could came maybe learn to float in the bottom of air, of air as the spider do. And this means that the, the, let's say the sphere, I don't like to talk it, uh, like a balloon, but have been built with, within the mind that it might have a second life. Uh, and hopefully we can bring it to a certain extent. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all.